I'm Lily Madwhip, and I've got an army now. You hear that, Hecate? You hear me coming for you? I guess it's not really an army so much as a squad. Maybe a small group. Okay, so it's like a book club. My mom goes to a book club. They like to read books about men who wear shirts they can't button up, and then they sit around and eat crackers with spinach and talk about the books. I had a book club. Just me and Pasher. He's read everything, so he always comes prepared. We read books about people who can button their shirts. You hear that, Hecate? Me and my book club are coming to kick your bony... Miss Lily, wait. We fall behind. Hipsauce calls. That's not really his name. I'm not very good with names. It took me months to get used to saying Pasher's name. I was five then. I called him Baxter at first, like Baxter Stockman. He's a giant bug man. Hip Sauce is a giant bat man, like he's a man with actual bat wings. It's kind of freaky, but I try not to judge people on their appearances. Freaky looking people gotta try harder to seem normal. If anything, normal people are more likely to be freaky on the inside. Hip Sauce is hobbling behind me, helping the woman with half a face walk. She seems really weak. I thought maybe everyone was starved from being in a cage, so before we left the dungeon, I made a table covered in Oreos appear, but trying to eat an Oreo with half your head missing is tricky. Hipsaw snacked on them eagerly, but they kept falling out of the half-faced lady's half of a face. It was really kind of gross to watch. It was really kind of gross to watch? She's like a picture in the book we got for health class that shows all the parts inside your head. Past them are the others, like a dozen or so tired-looking puzzle people in a giant minotaur. I guess that would make him a maxotar? Minotaurs are probably midget-sized tars. There might also be an invisible dog thing somewhere nearby called Magic Bean or something like that. Like I said, I'm not good with all these weird names. Why couldn't people in ancient times just name things Invisible Dog Beast or just Gary? Watch out for the Gary! That Gary better have its rabies shot. I can't believe the neighbors let their Gary poop on my lawn. I wonder if an invisible dog makes invisible poop. Oh my god, I could be walking through piles of it right now. You guys need more Oreos? I ask. No, please, no more Oreos. Someone in the back shouts. I wish I could see who it was. I don't trust someone who doesn't want Oreos. I've been following this trail of string. It led me to the dungeon first, but just kept going out the other side. I know it sounds weird to follow a string, but it was left here by a guy long ago, and apparently it leads to the middle of the maze, which is where Hecate hangs out. I've read all this before. It's part of Greek mythology, like what I read in the library before Ambrose turned it into his personal village. I can't remember if it was Perseus or Thurseus or Jason or Hercules. Whichever one wasn't in Clash of the Titans or the one with the astronauts, I think. I love that everybody has weird names except Jason. <laughs> I wonder if he got made fun of for his normal name back then. <laughs> Anyway, we get to a four-way intersection and the string goes around a corner. It's not the first time. I've been following it around corners for what seems like forever, but this time I turn the corner and Hecate's standing there. She's just sitting on her big stone chair in the middle of the hall. No, wait. I look around. I'm in her living room, or throne room, whatever it's called. The room with the pillars and the chandelier with all those candles. That's seriously a lot of candles. All her followers are standing around talking to each other. Some lady laughs. I think I just missed hearing a funny joke, and I feel a little disappointed. <sighs> it's going to eat at me now. I want to know what the joke was. Lillian? Hecate hisses. Everyone in the room suddenly goes quiet and turns to look at her. Nobody looks at me. Wait, how did I get here? I look around. Maybe I was confused about where I was? Nope, this is the room with the pillars. The turn in the hallway I was just at is gone. Hipsauce and Maxotar and all the others in my book club are also gone. Come to me. Hecate says in a low voice as she pets her big black dog. 
I feel a moment of panic at the sight of the dog because I think it's Ono and that she's betrayed me. But then it occurs to me that this is not the same big black dog that was actually Ono. I saw this dog the first time I was here, and Ono was with me. I wonder if this dog has a name, or if it's another person like Ono, only it likes to stay in doggy form. I just gotta remember that Ono is actually out in my world fetching the surprise. <laughs> Fetch. <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> mm. I take a step forward to say something to Hecate, and I bang my head on an invisible wall. Ow. It hurts, and I stumble back, holding my head. Somebody puts their hand on my shoulder. I turn to look. It's hip sauce. Why are you hitting yourself? He asks. He sounds just like my brother Roger when we'd sit beside each other in the car and he'd take my hand and slap me across the face with it. Why are you hitting yourself, ass face? He'd always ask. Oh, Roger. I turn back to Hecate, but I'm staring at a stone wall. I'm in the hallway again. Only now my head hurts. Stupid visions. I think Hecate knows we're coming, I say, rubbing my noggin. Also, watch out for that wall. The book club murmurs. I look at them. Somebody in the back flops over, leans against the wall, and slowly slides down it. I can't tell if he's copying me or just dead. Stop acting all surprised, I say sternly. I try to sound like my mother when she's talking to me about emptying the dishwasher. We're wandering in this maze of closet doors Hecate made with her mind. She can change anything to whatever she wants just by thinking about it. You think she's not going to see us coming a mile away? I hope it's not a mile away. My legs are getting tired. Someone in the back shouts, If she can change anything, how can we fight her? I recognize the voice. It's the guy who didn't want more Oreos. Everyone moves out of the way so I can see him. He's a normal-looking guy in some sort of dirty cloth diaper thing. He's so thin and all his bones are visible under his skin. I wonder what Snakebud did to him for a moment. But then something moves under his skin. Like tentacles wrapping around his bones. Ugh, I shudder as I watch them squirm. When they stop moving, he looks normal again. But I can still tell they're there. You probably can't, I admit. I think only I can. She might even think you out of existence or back into your cages. I don't know. Most of you aren't real anyway, though, so... I shrug. I'm no good at pep talks. I'm real. Diaper Man thumps his fist against his chest. We're all real. He thumps it again. I think he thinks that thumping his chest proves a point. Shouting and hitting yourself don't prove points unless the points you're trying to make is that you might be crazy. Some of the tentacles inside him wiggle angrily and then go still. Ooh. Everyone else watches me and I realize they expect me to say something. Look, I don't want to argue with you, Mr. Diaper Man. He beats his chest again and snorts, interrupting me. My name is Astyanex. Of course it is. I don't want to argue with you, Mr. Nasty Lawnax. You say you're real, so you're real. He steps closer and stares down at me. When he opens his mouth to speak, I can see that some of his teeth are missing. There's also something far back in his throat that seems to be wiggling around like a bunch of worms. Ooh, maybe it's worms inside him, not tentacles. I hope he doesn't barf worms on me. Why should we follow a girl child? I could tear you into pieces with my fingers. Because I just saved your lives? He reaches toward me with one hand and I pull back. I can see things under his skin squirming about. Look at you, he whispers. You reek of fear. It's true. I'm trying to act brave, but inside, I'm ready to pee my pants. I don't want to see Hecate. If I could, I'd sneak past her, find the door home, and never look back. But the way things have been going, I know that wouldn't work. I have to be brave, not just act it. 
Maybe those are the same thing. Maybe nobody is brave. They just act brave. Mr. Lonax touches my hair. I flinch. More murmuring passes through the rest of the book club. I follow Miss Lily, Hipsaw says. He's leaning the half-faced woman against a wall and steps between Mr. Lonax and me. She freed me, killed Lamia. No, she didn't. That thing did. Nasty Lonax jabs at the air with his fingers like it's a donut and he's trying to poke through the donut hole. But actually, he's pointing at my Maxitar. Everyone looks at Maxitar and some more murmuring starts going through the book club. Maxitar puts his hands up in the classic, don't drag me into this, gesture. Whenever I'm at school and I sense that something's going to happen before it does, I try to warn people. They ignore me. It happens. And then they accuse me of causing it. I have to make that gesture all the time. Having hip sauce between us gives me a small surge of confidence. I made that Maxitar! I stamp my foot. My shoes kick up a cloud of dust. Somebody really needs to sweep in here. And I can make a hundred more! Nasty Lonax crosses his arms. Then you don't need us. No. No, I don't need them. I could make a hundred Maxitars instead. Then again, I could make an entire army of Maxitars, and they'd be just as useless against Hecate as my book club. She could probably think any of them out of existence. Or is it that we can't affect things the other creates? Except I totally trashed a section of her door maze by accident. Or rather, Samuel did, and she blames me for it. I don't really know. That's why I'm counting on Ono. I'm not making- Look, I- You- I clench my fist and think of home. I have to speak slowly and try not to yell or think about turning nasty lawn axe inside out with my mind. I'm not asking you to fight for me, Mr. Lawn axe, but do you really want to sit around here? If I die, Hecate or someone will eventually find you and put you back in a cage or something. If I beat Hecate, I don't plan to come back this way or anyway, and you'll be sitting around here forever while the maze falls apart around you. But if you come with me, and I win, maybe we can figure something out for you guys. Nasty Lonax doesn't look the least bit impressed. He holds up his index finger. I look up, thinking he's pointing at the ceiling. Oh, there's nothing there. I should probably be careful not to fall for people pointing at the ceiling just to make me look that way, because that's a good way to get stabbed. Or, he says calmly, we can just do this. And then he straightens up, adjusts his diaper, walks over to the plain-looking door with a glass knob and brass hinges, turns the knob, opens the door, looks back at me, makes a gesture with a different finger, then steps through and shuts the door behind him. Did he really just do that? I ask. I can't believe he just did that. Who even knows where the door goes? He could be in China or Australia right now. I hear they have spiders as big as your head and poison frogs in Australia. I used to think it would be cool to go see Australia because apparently the toilets flush backwards or something there, but then I found out that it's over one with stuff that can kill you. Only Crocodile Dundee can survive Australia. I walk over to the door and open it to talk to him. The room on the other side is dark. <sighs> I walk over to the door and open it to talk to him. The door on the other side is dark. It must be nighttime here. I can just make out his silhouette crossing what appears to be a child's room. He keeps stepping on the toys that squeak. Hey, I whisper at him. Hey, you can't be in here. He ignores me. Something growls. It sounds like a dog, but not one of those nice dogs like you see people walking with and you ask, can I pet your dog? And they say, okay, because they don't know that pretty much every animal you touch dies and then you pet the dog and it licks your hand and your face and you just want to hit the person with a rock and steal the dog because you love it so much. No, this is more like one of those dogs that you see in the backyard with a fence and a sign that reads, no trespassing. And the dog starts barking before you even realize it's there and someone tells you later about a kid who accidentally lost a frisbee over the fence and they climbed into the person's yard and the dog bit their legs off. The growl gets louder. Nasty Lonax pauses for a second. I think he hears it too. 
How could you not? It sounds like a motor on a very old motorcycle. And then he puts his foot down slowly and a long, agonizing squeak of air being let out of a rubber duck fills the quiet. The growl turns into a sharp bark and something big and dark launches across the shadowy room. Nasty Lonak shouts and throws his arms up. I can only barely make him out from the light coming in through the closet door behind me, but what I see is the top of his head seems to flip backward at his mouth and blood red silly string comes gushing out. Except it's not silly string, it's worms. Hundreds of crazy long worms. Oh my god, he's got a flip-flop head that lets him turn into a worm flail. It's the most awful thing I've seen in a long time, and I instantly regret being here to see it. The dog, very furry, maybe a German shepherd, I can't tell, lands in nasty lawn axe's arms and is immediately tangled in the worms coming out of the top of his head. It seems to try to bite him, but then it starts yelling like one does when you step on its paw. The worms are all over it, wrapping it like a cocoon. I could hear the sound of them sliding over its body. I want a gag, so I do. Ugh. Stop! I managed to yell. Somewhere else in the house that we're now standing in, I hear shouts of grown-ups in some foreign language and doors being slammed. Uh-oh. What do I do? I can't be here. I look back through the closet door and the rest of the book club watches. Their faces are a mixture of indifference and disgust. I guess some of them have seen worse. The half-faced woman isn't even looking. She's just staring at the floor. I want to apologize to her for thinking she was ugly because this worm flail head thing, it, it's so much worse. A door gets thrown open on the other side of the room and the lights come on. I can now see Nasty Lawnax in all of his horrible glory. He's looking at me with the eyes on the upper half of his head, which is flipped towards me as the red worms fountaining out of his skull hold up pieces of the dog and throw them toward the man with the black hair who stormed into the room with a shotgun in his hands. Somebody screams. I can't blame them. I'd scream too, but I'm all out of screams at the moment. The shotgun goes off. I can feel something wet spray all over me. Hipsaw suddenly reaches through the closet door, grabs my arm and pulls me back through. I get a glimpse of Nasty Lonax and his flip top head striding toward the poor homeowner angrily. There's blood all over the floor and walls, along with bits of the poor dog and wriggling worms. The homeowner screams again as Nasty reaches him and more worms erupt from his neck. I can see the barrel of the shotgun sticking up between the two. It's pointed directly at me. Shut the door! I yell. Hipsauce throws the door shut in the same moment that I hear the thunder of the gun go off. The entire door cracks and a giant hole explodes in the middle of it, throwing splinters at everyone. But no shotgun pellets are with it, just wood bits. I can see through the hole and there's nothing but smooth stone on the other side. It's like the door is just glued to the wall. Oh God, I whisper. It's all I can think to say considering what just happened. Nasty Lonax is out there somewhere now, and I have no idea where. I wipe my face. There's blood drops all over me and bits of wood in my hair. The rest of the book club seem lost and confused. Murmuring starts again, and a couple of people get up and just walk off before I can say anything more. Hipsauce walks over to the half-faced woman and helps her back up, letting her lean on him. Let's go, he says with a nod. But... I'm a little shell-shocked. Door is gone. You can't go there. We go to Hecate. We walk down the hall for another 15 minutes, following the string left, then left, then right, then left. There's more lefts and rights in there, but you get the idea. There was a moment during it where I wondered if the stupid string was playing a trick on me and I was just going in circles, but I picked out a door each stretch of hallway and memorized it to see if I spotted it again later and didn't. I, I can't stop trembling. I can't stop thinking about Nasty Lonax or that poor man and his dog. I keep seeing the shotgun in my head pointed directly at me. Finally, we reach an intersection where the string turns a corner, and I recognize it. Not because we did go in circles after all, but because it's the intersection in my vision. Around this corner is Hecate. I face the book club and hold both hands up. Around this corner, I say, trying to sound dramatic, but I'm no good at acting, is Hecate. I can't promise you'll be safe, 
So maybe the best idea for you all is to wait right here. If anything goes wrong, just do like Mr. Lonax and head through a door. Just look before you go in. Because there might be a dog on the other side and not one of those nice dogs like you see people walking and you ask to pet it and they let you and you pet the dog and it licks you and you want to hit them with a rock and take it home. Everyone looks at each other. I'm really bad at pep talks. What I'm trying to say is watch out for dogs that will bite your legs off. Unless you don't have any legs. Somebody without legs grunts. In which case, protect your other parts. Hipsauce talks to a man with eyes all over his head, then hands the half-faced lady to him. He walks over to me, smiles in a way that says, I'm probably going to die, but I want to do this anyway, and then nods quietly. Maxitar runs his big fingers along the edge of his axe. Everyone else looks at the three of us and then shuffle back into the darkness a bit. I really hope they don't do anything stupid while I'm getting myself killed. All right, I say. Let's get this over with. I haven't heard a single word from Ono. I don't know if she failed to get the surprise or betrayed me entirely or is still off in my world doing who knows what. I gotta remember that time works different here in the Vale. Mom, Dad, how long have I been gone? Is my photo on milk cartons? Do you think Jamal will tell everyone that I died from a lack of sleep? Do you think if I get back, I can have one of those milk cartons with my picture on it and keep it as a souvenir? I close my eyes and try to see the future. All I see are the veins in my eyelids. Whatever. I turn the corner. Hecate's living room is as big and fancy as it was when she dragged me out of it and tossed me in the void. Tall pillars all over the place, fancy chandelier, all that jazz. My mom has a word for places like it. I just can't remember what the word is right now because I'm standing in the door with hip sauce and Maxitar facing the crowd of followers and Hecate herself sitting on her throne with her big black dog beside it. The worst part is that she was staring straight at me the moment I entered, like she'd been waiting for me to come around the corner the whole time I was giving my good dog, bad dog pep talk to the book club. So you returned, she says. She smiles at me, but it's not a friendly smile. It's like when you have to play dodgeball in gym class and one of the boys with a cannon arm gets you in his sights and he smiles like that. So you returned is Hecate's way of saying, I'm going to replace your head with this dodgeball. I step forward and raise my fist at her. I, I just want to go home. I had something better planned to say, but I forgot it in the last second. I think it was something like how I was going to chew her up and spit her out, but now that I think about it, I'm not really one for talking tough. You're never going home, Hecate says. She stands up. The big black dog continues to sit there by her chair. That's a, that's a good dog, I think. It still might be a leg biter. Maybe I can turn it into a mouse or a frog. I need to remember that I can do anything here. I'm just as strong as Hecate. I don't want to fight you. Hecate holds her hands up in front of her. You will fight me, or... She claps twice. I half expect the lights to go out, but then I remember that the lights are candles, and you can't hook up a clapper to candles. I butcher your little friend. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Not Simone, please. Not Jamal. The sea of people around her chuckle and then a bunch move aside and a man wearing a black potato sack on his head and no shirt steps forward. He reminds me of the men on the cover of Mom's book club books, only they didn't wear potato sacks on their heads because they actually had really amazing, beautiful hair. This guy probably doesn't have any hair, and he's embarrassed because he got so fed up with the shirt having no buttons that he just stopped wearing it completely. He's got someone by the arm. It's a girl. She struggles against him, but he's a grown-up, and she's barefoot in blue pajamas with cartoon kittens on them. It's... It's Lisa Welch. She looks at me and stops thrashing against the shirtless man wearing a potato sack on his head. Lily? She says. She looks as confused as I am. Lily effing Mad Whip? Are you kidding me? She actually says effing. 
Lisa yanks her arm hard and manages to pull free from the potato sack man. What the F, Lily? What the F, Lisa? I say back. I look at Hecate. Are you kidding me? She's not my friend. I hate Lisa Welch. What the F? Lisa shouts, throwing her hands in the air in the classic Lisa Welch annoyance. She looks around at the crowd and I think it starts to dawn on her that the people she's surrounded by are not exactly normal looking. She turns slowly and finally looks up at the shirtless man with the black potato sack hat. I can see the horror in her eyes when she looks back at me. She starts babbling. Hecate's grin falters. She looks at Lisa and narrows her eyes. If she's not your friend, then you won't care if I just rip her little head off. I hold up a finger like Mr. Lonax did to me earlier. Okay, I would pay all my allowances for a year to watch Lisa Welch get picked clean by ants, but... I gotta think of a but. I never actually want anybody to get hurt. When I imagine pushing Lisa into the Grand Canyon, that's just a thought. I would never follow through with any of them. Lisa finally stops stuttering and seems to regain a bit of her composure. Oh, baloney! She shouts, turning to Hecate. Do you know what she did to me? She flails her arms in my direction like she's trying to slap at me from across the room. She made me trip and break my teeth and then her and her psycho friend nearly burned me alive. That's... I was going to say it wasn't true, but it's kind of true. I didn't mean to make Lisa trip and break her teeth. And she was picking on my third best friend Meredith when her backpack caught fire, which wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been nearby. Hecate falls back into her chair and crosses one leg over the other. She puts her chin in her hand. Maybe I should make you both fight to the death. Lisa and I look at each other. The victor gets to be my pet. I thought you wanted me to fight you, not her. Hecate waves her hand. Oh, you'll still have to contend with me after. But you bore me. Killing you will be easy. I want some entertainment. Kill your little not-a-friend, and then I will dispense with putting you out of your misery. Lisa clenches her fists and glares at me. She grits her pretty new perfect teeth that her daddy paid for. What the F, Lily? What have you gotten me into? Hecate stands back up and slowly glides down the stairs from her stone chair. I can't even see her legs moving under her long dress. It really looks like she's floating. She float walks through the followers at the bottom of the steps and glides over to Lisa. Lisa looks up at her and Hecate takes Lisa's chin in her hand, locking eyes. What do you say, my pretty little one? Hecate reaches into the folds of her dress and slowly pulls a shiny silver blade out. It's much fancier looking than the one I made when I was practicing with Ono. Hecate's really got the hang of making things out of nothing. Would you like to stab Lillian over and over until you see the life leave her eyes? Would you like to feel her warm blood flow over your hands? Yes, I want to feel her warm blood flow over my hands. Lisa repeats the words in a slow, trance-like voice. No, you don't, Lisa, I yell. Yes, I do. Lisa's right arm stops twitching. She reaches up with it and takes the dagger from Hecate's hand. In response, Hecate lets go of her chin and Lisa's entire body seems to relax. I can see the knuckles on her hand turning white as she squeezes the hilt of the dagger. I don't know what she's thinking, if anything, anymore. Lisa Welch and I are the complete opposite of friends. I don't want to say we're enemies. We're not at war or anything. We just don't ever talk and we kind of hate each other. I think I have more right to hate her than she has to hate me. But I don't know what she thinks or if she's got some secret reason that she hates me. That's the problem here. I don't know if she hates me enough to actually try to kill me. It seems like Hecate has taken choice off of the table, though. Lisa seems to be under a spell. I reach out and think about a massive sword, shiny and sharp. It's Excalibur, the sword that runty kid Arthur pulled out of stone in the Disney movie. I'm pulling it forth from the stone, but the stone is the air, and... It's a rusty-looking butterfly knife. <sighs> I don't want to do this. 
Lisa turns to face me with her blade. Her eyes are glossy and glazed over. Okay, she might be under a spell, or she might just be really tired. After all, it looks like Hecate's goons grabbed her in the middle of the night. I like her kitty pajamas. If it wasn't Lisa, I'd compliment her on them. But she's a big jerk and she's gonna stab me, so she gets nothing. Lisa steps forward, brushing past Hecate, the dagger at her side. Maxitar snorts and lifts his axe, gripping the handle with both hands. No! I yell at him. Don't hurt her. I... I got this. Oh, Lisa. Don't make me kill you. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast. You can find Mr. Creepypasta Storytime on any kind of podcasting platform if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening to the podcast already, you can find Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube. <laughs> for those of you that are interested in seeing me do more than just tell scary stories, you can also check me out at twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta. During the weekdays around 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, I usually stream video games. And sometimes they're Resident Evil, and sometimes they're not. I'm also on Patreon. You can find a whole bunch of other people supporting on Patreon in the description down below, but there is a very, very special thank you to these people in particular. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Creepypasta Adam, Ken Lando Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Steven Van Huss, Chance Burton, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Steampunk Sinner, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, S-Man, Kirisuba, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Somber Puppet, Wolfie Numbs, Shadow Morningstar, Sean Mills, Jesse Gonzalez, Mad Marstomp, Z Kearley, Cassie Core, Mr. Thud, and Patrick Schoolmeister. These guys are the real MVPs, and all of you who are listening are also the real MVPs. Stay safe, everyone, and sweet dreams. <laughs>